brief us on the topic of Cities by the Sea, Global Impact of Coastal Change, we are thrilled to introduce Dr. Beverly Goodman Chernoff. Dr. Goodman Chernoff is an associate professor at the University of Haifa's Leon H. Charney School of Marine Sciences. She is head of the Marine Geosciences Department and a National Geographic Explorer. Dr. Goodman Chernoff earned her MA in Anthropology from Penn State and a PhD from McMaster University, Department of Geology and Earth Sciences. Her research focuses on ancient harbors, disasters, and coastal change. Her work has contributed to tsunami disaster planning and education here in Israel and the Eastern Mediterranean. Dr. Goodman Chernoff studies how archaeology, geology, and anthropology of marine systems help us understand how nature and humans have impacted our coastlines and what the relationship will bring to the future. Her Corona pet is, eclectus, is an eclectus parrot named Major Tom, whom she loves almost as much as her husband and, and, uh, and boys. Today, we are delighted that Dr. Goodman Chernoff is here with us to discuss how population increase is straining our coastal cities around the world. As questions arise during the session, please go ahead and post them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, and they will be addressed at the end by Dr. Goodman Chernoff and facilitated by Jake Scharfman, our colleague. Dr. Goodman Chernoff, welcome. Wow, thank you for such a nice introduction. Um, give me a second here to share my screen. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depends on what time zone you're in. Um, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really, excited about talking to you today about this topic. Uh, this is actually a subject that is incredibly important to me. It's also a subject that I rarely get to talk about in, in such a public format. So I'm, I'm really uh, excited about this opportunity and, and I'm, I really appreciate that I was invited to do so. Now, um, I will talk a little bit later about the department itself, but I want to go ahead and go straight into the research because um, and straight into the subject itself, because I think this is uh, something that uh, I don't want to 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 miss any element of it um, uh, in the hour that we have. So what I'm going to talk about today is this. If I can go to the next slide, just a moment. Here we go. OK, so I want to start with something really basic, which may sound obvious, but what is a coastline? I mean, what does this mean? You know, we, we all refer to going to the coast, we, we talk about this issue, but the thing about a coastline is that it really doesn't actually, in some ways it doesn't exist because it's, it's changing all the time because it's where the land meets the sea. So where does the land meet the sea? Well, it's where the water and the land meets. So this is somewhere that's extremely dynamic. So it really depends, you know, where's the sea? Is the sea level higher? Is it lower? If we go at, you know, anyone who's familiar with being around um, the ocean will know, okay, well, if you have a high tide, if you have a low tide, you have things that are changes that are on a daily basis and you have changes that are on a monthly or annual basis. So it's, it's a place that's constantly in flux. So even though it's this incredibly unstable place, it also happens to be one of the most desirable places for humans on the planet. And why is this? I mean, this, this, if we look at it from an ancient perspective, we can think about all of the resources, all of the, the marine resources that people can access. We can think about, they also have the terrestrial. If there's a river coming into the ocean, then we're you know, talking about you know, very, very rich and diverse uh, uh, landscape. And you also have the opportunity to connect with the other people, okay? Once you have, once you introduce boats and rafts and ships, then you're talking about a place where you have this, this immediate connection to commerce. Um, so this is not only good just in terms of economics, it's also something that can create stability. Um, it can help in the, in the case of having some sort of shortages or being able to specialize in certain areas because you can trade or purchase from other people. Um, and then there's all the cultural significance of that and the contact and the information and um, the culture that gets passed in, in such a, an environment. So it's, it, it's always been um, an area that has been good for people to live in. Um, 
and here as I talk a little bit more about that, this is a this is a drone shot of part of the coast of Israel near the ancient site of Caesarea, and of course we're very familiar with with all of the advantages of this place. Um, but like I said, the coastline in some ways isn't really a place; it's many places. It's a it's a moving target. Um, it's something that is is changing you know like a river that it's it's never the same day to day but indefinitely on a longer time scale we see a lot of changes so i'm interested in looking at what are those changes what's happened in the past and how can this help us understand what could happen in the future and also understand how people have responded to it now i promise i'm not going to put too many graphs out um, during the during the talk, but some of them are just uh, too good and too important to to skip. And one of them is is this graph um, that's already almost twenty years old, but it's showing the relationship between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, sea level, and temperature. Now, a lot of people when we talk about climate change, and particularly people who um, question or, or uh, deny the, the existence of climate change or the human contribution to it, they will often say, oh, well, you know, sea level has changed and temperatures change and these are all natural processes. So it's important that I put this out there and we, we address this because that is true, all right? We have, we do in fact, if you look at this red line, those are increasing and decreasing temperatures. And what we see on this graph is 400,000 years. So on the right side, we're looking at coming towards today. And on the left, we have 400,000 years ago. So you can see that whenever it goes over this, this line, that basically is our modern sea level, our sea level from today. And when it goes below that, that means that the water is, is lower than today, that it, the sea level has fallen. So when we look at these lower, lower areas, that's what we most people would think of as uh, the ice ages, okay, the glacial periods. And when we get to the upper area, it's called an interglacial or between the, the ice ages. So as you can see, we've had interglacial and glacial and interglacial and glacial and interglacial and glacial. And today it is true that we are at the one of these peaks of an interglacial. Now, along with that temperature and sea level change, and, and this goes together because if you're warming, the, the planet has a certain amount of water and water can be a solid as ice. It can be a gas in the atmosphere, or it can be liquid as, a wa as water. So of course, when the planet cools, you have more of this water being stored in ice. And then when you're warming, you, this enters into the basins and fills the ocean. So during those colder periods, that's when we get that sea level fall. And during the warmer period, that's when we see the increase. Now, but if we look at the green line, this is where things get a bit tough, okay? You can see that this, the carbon dioxide follows the temperature and it follows the sea level, except, see this triangle way up here? Okay, and I added this on here because already in 20 years, the increase has gone off of the graph that was produced for this paper. So what's happening is that we don't actually know what this all means. We do not have a, for the past half million years, we do not have um, a natural comparison. We have no analog. So, so when people talk about, oh, this has happened and this is how it is, no, it is not. We do not actually know, uh, we do not have a direct comparison. Okay, but let's let's uh, let's zero in on a little more recent, a little more uh, 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 related to to the past ten thousand years, twenty thousand years of human history. Um, in geological terms, we call that now, <laughs> but but we'll talk about tens of thousands of years, ten thousand years. Um, and we can see that the sea level is rising. This is a sea level curve. It's rising, 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 rising. Um, and we reconstruct these sea level curves based on records from corals, records from uh, ice cores, but we don't always know for certain exactly how, what, what the, we're connecting the dots. So whether or not some of these increases are faster or slower, the actual rate, we don't always have the kind of resolution that we would like. 
we know that there are these pulses where the, where the input of water is pretty fast and then the sea level rises pretty rapidly, but we don't really know for sure. Are we talking about uh, 3000 years as fast or with 10 meters, or are we talking about 30 years? Okay, so this is, this is part of um, the area that I'm particularly interested in because of course, we, we'd like to know what's gonna happen with sea level around the planet today. So as I mentioned, I'm using geoarchaeology, which is applying geological and combining it with archaeological information in order to get these analogs from the past. So the first, first example I want to show you just to demonstrate um, what this means that sea level changes and how the landscape is affected, I want to go to a place called Caesarea. I hope many of you have been there. This is uh, what I'm showing here is a, uh, a water color of, of what it may have looked like 2000 years ago during the Roman period. And we did some research there where we surveyed, it was with the University of Texas, Austin, John Goff and, and Jamie Austin and other colleagues. And we, we surveyed and did a map of the area where we could look at the seafloor and then actually penetrate beneath the seafloor in order to understand what, what is under the sand. What does, what does the ground underneath the sand look like offshore of Caesarea? Um, and this was actually done in the same area that I just showed you the, the, uh, the nice uh, drone footage. And what we found is on the left here, this is the bathymetry. This is, this is like a topographic map underwater you, where the colors represent the depth. So the green is actually a, a sort of a, a, a higher point um, on the landscape. It's a sort of rocky outcrop. And then you have some more um, rocky outcrop areas here. And this is what it looks like today. So we, we, this map helps us orient ourselves and get a sense of, of the surroundings. Now on the right side, this is, imagine that we've removed all the sand. We've removed all the sand, we've removed all of the material by you know, our geophysical mapping of the sub bottom profiler. We're able to actually take off those layers. And what we see beneath all that, if you can notice this line here and this curvy line here, we actually see river channels from the past. So what we're looking at here is the landscape when sea level was lower. And so when sea level was lower, there was more land. Okay, so when, when it's lower, you have more land. And of course, when it's rising, you're gonna have erosion of your coastline and you're gonna, loop, well, the coastline's gonna move because the coastline always moves, um, but that's, that's the difference between when the sea level is falling and the sea level is rising. But the question is how fast did sea level rise? You know, we, we care, you know, a lot of times you'll hear comments about 1.5 millimeters per year, three millimeters per year, but does it really happen as millimeters per year or can it happen faster than that? So in the same area in Caesarea, a few years ago, we, we were looking at, and we're still looking at these beautiful features underwater that we call craters or pits. And these, what we noticed was that they were actually all at the same, there were a series of them in multiple areas on the coastline that were all at the same depth. Okay, now why is this interesting? How does this, what, how does this relate to sea level? Well, it turns out that these features are formed when they're at sea level. So here's, here's a modern analog. Okay, so today, and you, you probably, uh, you're correct if you're looking at these going, oh, you mean tide pools? Well, yeah, basically these are tide pools. They're eroded out from, just from the wave action and currents and, and you have uh, material that erodes away in, in, in the and creates these uh, circular features. But this is really it was exciting because these notches and these eroded areas that are normally at sea level, we were seeing underwater and all at the same depths. And the only way that that could happen is if we had sea level at those depths for long enough to create them. And also that sea level rose at a speed that didn't destroy the notch or didn't destroy the craters in the process. Because if it were very slow, then of course it would erode it out. And so we became interested or I became interested in what is, if these are all the same depth, what's its age? If we can figure out the age, we can know when it was at that level, when sea level was at that depth. And we can also try to figure out whether or not it moved. We already know that it had to move relatively quickly, but maybe we can we can compare it to the data that we have and know know whether we're talking about uh, how how rapid. 
So we took this information, we put it on one of the sea level curves and there are two notches actually, and one at two and a half meters deep. So, um, you know, somewhere around uh, five feet and the other one somewhere around uh, 10, 12 feet below sea level. And we just put it over the top of the sea level curve that was created by looking at uh, archeological sites near the coastline. Cause obviously people didn't live underwater. So if you find a house, this gives you a sea level marker. Now, all the triangles that you see here are from um, other research um, by other people where they were able to bracket the sea level based on limitations because of, of human occupation or, or materials. And you can see that these notches, the depth are are, are in the middle area. And what's really wild about this, or you know, perhaps uh, helps to explain is that there's no archeological data, huh? So we have coastal settlements at this, sorry, I should, I should clarify, this is time, okay? So before the notches, we have coastal settlements. After the notches, we have coastal settlements, but we have about, what is this, two, 2000 years with nothing. Huh, why would that be? So for some reason, we have a coastal abandonment. Well, if we measure that difference and those shifts, and if they were rapid, we can say that we have a, a sea level change that's at least eight feet, possibly up to 30 feet, if we go to the extreme sides of this, in a short period. And maybe this was in decades rather than years. If this happened very quickly, it makes sense that people would leave the coastline, even though it's a desirable place, and not come back for a generation or two, or three, or maybe a thousand years. Um, a lot of times, uh, this this is this can be a response to to such a, a rapid change. Now. How does this relate to us today? Well, this is a wonderful uh, film that was published in the New York Times about two years ago, um, based on research where they were looking at the density in ice in Greenland. And the issue is, is as the density of the ice is changing, it also changes the speed at which the water can enter into the whole ocean system. And the question was, are we, are we hitting this, uh, are we passing this breaking point? And if we do, how much water is gonna be added at once? And how much water added is important because that relates to how fast and how high the sea level will become. And their estimates actually put it possibly in the realm of 10 feet. And as you can see, this uh, this made made news in many other places. Where you know why is this so important? It's not only a scientific. Uh, it's very important because not only is it interesting from a scientific perspective, policy and coastal planning needs to know if you've got to prepare for millimeters per year, or perhaps are we talking about in a decade? You know, and that's a very big difference in terms of how you need to prepare or or be ready to respond. Now, the title of this talk is talking about coastal populations and climate change and how, how these things relate and uh, what, how it's impacting one another. At the moment, we have a very large human population. You know, in the past 50 years, we've, we've grown exponentially from about a billion to nearly 8 billion people in the past 100 years. And 40% of that population lives within 100 kilometers of, of the coastline. And it's been proposed that within about 30 years, it's possible that that percentage could get as high as 60 or 70%. And within just a kilometer or two or a mile of the, of the coastline, um, that increase is, is the most acute. Why is this of great concern? Well couple of things. When this is the case, the way that the populations are growing, number one, they're actually building large cities all over the world in places that were, were never occupied before, or certainly not with large settlements. And I'm going to return to that in a, in a, in a few slides as we talk about what that means. But it also means that there are a lot of coastal newcomers. Well, Okay, what, what does that matter? You know, so, so we have new people coming there. Well, there's a few problems. When you have a population that is new to a region, they lack any sort of institutional or generational knowledge. 
So in the case of things like tsunamis, this is a, a horrifying photograph from, from uh, Getty Images from 2004, um, the tsunami that happened in the Indian Ocean. And this is a photograph that haunts me and I'm sure it haunts many other people because you can see that these are people on the beach visiting tourists and even non-tourists who were there who didn't realize what was happening. They didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the warning, they weren't prepared. But in that same tsunami, as well as the tsunami in 2007, in places like, um, there were indigenous peoples that, that did have the generational knowledge and were able to respond to the signs that they saw on the landscape and had far less impact in terms of loss of life. So this is something that um, it does make a big difference. And the fact that we have all over the world about 50 years of extreme uh, movement and, and growth of cities on the coastlines means that a lot of this information, a lot of this awareness um, is not coming with those populations. There's also the, the aspect of seeing is believing. You know, if something doesn't occur in my lifetime or in my parents' lifetime, you know, and then on top of that, you're newcomers, it simply doesn't seem real, it doesn't seem relevant. Um, and if you don't see it in front of your own eyes, you know, that it's kind of like the difference sometimes when people confuse uh, a very cold storm in the winter time to climate change. You know, that, that just because you have a cold storm does not mean that, that the overall warming is not happening. And also there's the cost benefit relationship. Coastal property is incredibly valuable and many times, you know, we rebuild, we stay with our communities. So the value in the immediate is so much more valuable to us than this possible long-term or theoretical loss that, that is happening. So if we don't think it's gonna happen in a short period of time, which as I'm gonna talk about now, we don't know that it won't be happening in a, in a or we are seeing these things happen in a very rapid period of time, um, people are less likely to, to act upon it. Now this development is also, we have a feedback loop happening. As coastlines are being developed, we're also removing all over the world, a lot of the natural buffers. So this valuable property that's very desirable and many of it, much of it is being converted into uh, developed areas. So we're losing mangroves and dunes and estuaries and places that are, are natural buffers to events like tsunamis, as well as something to help control in the case of, uh, of sea level rise, hurricanes, storms, and other impacts on the coastline. Uh, one of my, I think one of the most dramatic examples of this would be Dubai. Um, a place which the, the film that I'm showing right now um, from uh, NASA has, shows the development of Dubai, not in 50 years, but actually in 20 years, if you can imagine that. So you can see here that this area that was a, a, a desert, um, the, the first pictures here are only from about 20 years ago, and over time it's become a massive uh, uh, um, a metropolitan area. And I have friends there and I'd love to go visit. Um, but it is a place that, that is, is freshly, you know, freshly created because, and why is that possible? How has this happened? Prior to the last 50 years, um, it was not a very nice place to live for most people. The people who lived there were really specialized for that landscape and for that environment. And it naturally kept the numbers of people who lived there to very small, simply because of the, the inconveniences and the challenges of being there. But today, most of those things can be solved. You have shipping by land, by sea, by air. Uh, you have the, the uh, ability to create drinking water from desalinization, uh, climate control. The photo on the top left is, is actually an indoor ski resort that's in Dubai, if you can imagine that. And the, and the and the image on the right is uh, plans for an air conditioned city where the entire city you would actually leave buildings and still be in climate control. So these are ways that a place that once was really for the for those who could who could really uh, tolerate those conditions and and today it's a place where many more people would feel comfortable living and so they do. 
We don't have to go to Dubai to see that. Uh, we have that same example even in Israel, in Eilat and Aqaba. In 1950, the population was below 10,000 people. And today it's a quarter of a million between the two towns and it even gets higher than that during, during uh, uh, tourism system, uh, the, the touristy periods, particularly before Corona. So here's an area that is hyper arid. Um, and today they have desalinization. So the water issue has been solved. Uh, the floods that come in have been mostly channelized so that they don't have to be concerned about um, the damage that would occur. Airplanes allow people to get there. So we've made it uh, worldwide, we've made it possible to inhabit and to uh, develop areas that previously were, were, were uninhabitable or at least not, not uh, to the scale and size of uh, populations. But all of this, the only way that all of this is done is fossil fuels, okay? This is why it's possible. This is where the, the, the capital comes to do that. And this is what makes all of those technologies, uh, uh, it make, makes these places uh, capable of, of development at this pace and, and to these uh, size populations. So just a another graph we'll go back to for a moment. So if we think about population growth, which has occurred very rapidly in the past century, and on top of that, we also have technological growth and we have fossil resource use. And so we have these three things happening together um, very, very quickly. Um, so what does, what is the problem? Well, what does fossil do? It's carbon. So when we are using fossil fuels, I like to think of it or explain it as, you know, we're, we're borrowing carbon from the Earth's past. You know, we're, we're up here on the top, you know, we're up here on the top in the Holocene um, or the Anthropocene as, as now it's being called um, or the period we're, we're in right now. And we're reaching back into our geological history to take those resources and then we're reintroducing that carbon into our atmosphere. And the only really natural, uh, the, the main natural pro process that, that, that does that would be volcanic eruptions and things like that that are taking these things out of, um, out of, um, out of the earth. But we are doing that ourselves. And so when we look at go, going back to this uh, uh, this uh, uh, carbon dioxide, and I see my, my triangle has fallen, it should be way up here. Um, we, it's very difficult for us to say that there's any other explanation for why the CO2, CO2 should be so high. You know, we have a very direct uh, reason and we have the outcome that we've, uh, we've added all this carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So there are rising temperatures that are going with that. And of course the rising sea level that's going with that as well. Now, another aspect when we look at climate change and coastal living and these population increases is that this has an effect on the increased moisture in the air Okay, so we have um, throughout the world, we're having aridification where areas are, are because of the rising temperatures, there's more evaporation <clears throat> and that moisture goes into the air. But what is interesting is that precipitation, it can hold it. You know, you just think of it as, you know, when you're, when you're evaporating something on the stove, when you're boiling water, as long as it's warm, it can hold that in the atmosphere. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have more precipitation, but you do have intensified. So storms get intensified when floods happen. When it does rain, it's it's more in one go, and then it causes more damage. And so this is so we, we have longer dry periods and more intense wet periods when we do have uh, precipitation, which is exactly what we're experiencing and exactly what we've been seeing for the last few years. So. I want to say, can we have a happy ending? Because <laughs> I've definitely uh, put out, you know, uh, some points for us to talk about and to think about and to to look at um, these trends that we certainly recognize that are going to be um, happening uh, going into the next few years. And I think there are a lot of good reasons for us to be optimistic on a global scale. One of those things is that literacy rates are increasing. And, and again, this is all on a global scale. And with rising literacy rates, 
I think this also means that awareness and concern and understanding of what our actions are doing will should also follow. Um, population growth rate is actually decreasing. We have a lower relative each year for the past 20, 20 years, we've actually been seeing uh, not a decrease in population, of course, because we have such a large population, but the growth rate has slowed down. Um, I've, I've been very, it's been very interesting to watch as this is being identified. And I've seen a lot of articles where they're talking about countries concerned about population growth, that they're worried about the fact that it's decreasing. And I'm thinking maybe this is not something that we need to be too worried about per se. It might be a good thing. Um, the only bad thing about it is for, for us as we grow old, um, not having enough younger people to, to actually support us. You know? So it's, it's a rather selfish desire in my mind that we, that we want that increase to continue to happen. Can we can maybe get to a plateau would be okay too. Um, life expectancy is increasing. People are living longer. I'm hopeful that longer life expectancy might help us with our generational knowledge that perhaps these this increasing literacy rates and increasing life expectancy Let's hope that this will also result in, in um, uh, improvement of our ability to, to, correct, um, to correct our course. Um, alternative energy use is increasing by, in its proportion of the market. And I think we're thinking about these issues. We're talking about it. There's far more awareness. And uh, this is, of course, the first step to really caring and, and doing some actions. And the other thing is that techno we, you know, they talk about us being in the information age and the technology age. Of course, every generation probably thought they were in the technology age, but now we're calling it the information age. But one of the reasons that um, we are quite unique in these past half century is that our adoption of technology is getting faster and faster and faster. What does this mean? Well, when cars were introduced, there was probably about, there was around 30 year period until it got to the level of, of use that we see today, even 40, 40 years. Whereas if you look at say, cell phones to tablets to, you know, other things that have been introduced technologically, we're very fast adopters now to the technology. And my hope is that because we're seeing this, this rapid adoption of new technology, as the better solutions come forward and as changes are, are introduced, um, will benefit, benefit from that, that, that the world has become uh, more open to, to those changes and adopting things quicker. So I just wanted to say those, those few things. There's a lot more information, of course, a lot more research that we're doing um, about sea level, about climate change today and also in the past. But I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of a taste of, of the way that we're, we're finding evidence from the past and the way that we're thinking about it. Um, so I do want to say thank you that there are a lot of, um, a lot of supporters uh, to, to this research over the years. Um, of course, uh, both locally and internationally. Um, also some individuals, uh, Norman Kirscher and Sir McDavis, uh, Eugene Cunningham and, and Lyda Hill have all been very supportive to the different work in, in, um, uh, in my laboratory as well as, as in the university at large. Um, so that is the end of the lecture. Maybe um, we'll we'll take some questions and, uh, and I'd, I'd be happy if we have time at the end, maybe I'll say a few more words about my department. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goodman Chernoff. Um, that was truly fascinating. And I think uh, if anyone's wondering what they can do to fight climate change, uh, supporting your research and university's Chinese School of Marine Sciences is certainly a step in the, in the right direction. Um, now, I do have some questions for you from our audience today and some which were submitted ahead of time. Um, as mentioned at the start of this webinar, please do send us any questions you might have uh, in the Q&A box if you're joining us uh, on Zoom and in the comment section of this video if you're joining us on social media. Uh, we'll be happy to address them during this Q&A session uh, with Dr. goodman Chernov. So um, I'm going to dive straight in. The first question, it, it, it's straight to the point, actually. Uh, what can we do on an individual level to help fight climate change? And will it make a difference? Well, you know, I, the, 
if there is an upside. Um, I think that, you know, I, I'll speak about myself, you know, my, my own experience um, with trying to tackle that very question. And, you know, there's there, you know, we, there are the basic things that we need to really consider. There's the individual changes, okay, the, the things that we can change as individuals. And a lot of people will say, well, but it doesn't matter because of industry. It doesn't matter because of, you know, X country is, is uh, creating so much, <laughs> so much carbon, you know, they're, they're polluting so much that what does it matter what I do as an individual? But I think that Corona made people see that when you do cut down, how much that can have an impact, whether it's the number of birds that are returning, whether it's um, you know, the quality of the air in the towns that we live in and the research now that's coming out from those individuals, you know, shipping didn't, didn't end. I mean, okay, it had some bumps in there, but you know, a lot of the large scale commercial things did, even though there was a drop, but then things kind of you know, came back. So who wasn't traveling? You know, it was a lot of individuals that we're cutting down. So, you know, I think that as an individual, it's important to really think about um, what do you, what is, what, what are your needs? You know, if you can, uh, you know, now we know I can give this talk on Zoom and certainly, you know, face-to-face -face contact is still very important and we need that. And there's things that are uh, different about it. But on the other hand, you know, maybe if a person um, typically takes 12 trips, maybe they can manage to do that in eight. You know, so, so I think that cutting those things down um, and, and, and also making that connection, you know, we, we have a lot of things that we expect convenience. We expect things to be uh, cheap and, um, and in high quantities. And I think that's something that we need to maybe rethink, you know, what, it, what is our sense of quality? Um, why, is that, why, why is that shirt so inexpensive? You know, and, and to understand that we're not paying the real costs of these things, you know, that at the moment, you know, if something is going across the world in bulk, and that's why the price is so low, you know, there's both the human price, you know, and, and there's also the environmental price. So we, I think a lot of it is just to, you know, on an individual level, you can start to think about what, where, where you can make some changes. So you know, um, it's not, and, and I do think that, that even those little changes will, will matter um, on a larger scale. Also, um, sorry, I'm making my answer way too long, but also, uh, of course, um, economically supporting companies that that have that those same values, putting your money, you know, into into the those places. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that analogy about the true cost as well. I mean, we spoke uh, offline and you mentioned even plastic, you know, it's it's a very cheap material, but the true cost of plastic is far greater in terms of what it does to the environment. Um, mm -hmm. Excellent. So I'm going to keep reiterating uh, for everyone, if you do have questions, and I am seeing questions coming through here, uh, do send them in, uh, again, the Q&A box on Zoom and uh, the comment section on social. So I'm going to go to one of those questions uh, right now. Um, someone asked, is there any overlap with the research of Dr. Michael McCormick, who is a, a renowned history department uh, yeah. professor at Harvard University on climate and human past? I'm going to take that one step further as well can you also mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that expand on some of the international collaborations that the university of haifa's uh, marine science program is uh, is currently working with on this topic excellent well wonderful question um certainly yes uh we there's overlap in the sense that we're thinking about very similar things trying to understand um you know the correlation and the correspondence between uh, these 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 issues of climate and how it's impacted us. McCormick um, has a wonderful researcher in that group as well, Alex Moore. Uh, he and I are uh, are regularly um, communicating and and coming up with new ideas, and we're we're at the moment uh, looking towards collaborating on some looking at these connective. Uh, issues and how how climate relates. I mean, when we think about natural, you know, we 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 are we are animals. You know, we do we do live on this planet like any other animal. Um, well, <laughs> very differently, but we 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 ultimately, um, you know, some people think, well, you know, 
you can't use an environmental explanation for everything. That's certainly true, but we do have to see how we, as part of this organism of the planet, um, the fact that we're we're really big ants. We do a, we do a heck of a lot <laughs> in the in, in the part of the planet that we we reach, which is basically everywhere. Wonderful. Um, excellent. So. Another question we have here is that President Biden has maintained um, since he came into office that he has a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 50 percent by the year 2030. Is this a realistic goal and, and how is such a drastic uh, cut achieved? Yeah. Um, realistic. <laughs> Um, that's, it, it's really hard to say. I think it is ambitious, um, but I also think that you, we have to keep in mind that we got into this situation because of technology. And I don't want to say, well, technology is going to get us out of it, but I, I do think that the you, you do have to have the encouragement and, you know, I know in the United States and I'm American too, there's, it's a bit, we, we, the United States doesn't like to have, you know, regulations telling you what you have to be doing or buying. But I'm hoping that if in those policies, it's encouraging it through incent incentivizing it. And I think that people, if the technology is better, if the costs are good, if the choices are attractive, then it's a possibility. And, and I think that the innovativeness and technological improvements um, and you know, taking it from the incentive side um, would make it possible because you know it's not as if if you if you look into the history of it electricity lost out to you know to to fuel so you know there there it could have gone a very different way and all that has to do with economics and technology and and adoption and and right now we're in a quick adoption uh culture and and population worldwide so i think uh i think we should try to be optimistic about it I'd like to be optimistic because that the other choice is pessimistic and that would be awful. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, so another question, this was one that was sent in uh, ahead of time. Um, and I believe it was someone that has recently dealt with, uh, with flooding in their home on the East Coast. Um, they asked, how is climate change linked to increased rainfall and are storms such as Henry and Ida something we can anticipate happening more regularly in the future? Right. So I'm I'm not um, a meteorologist, and, and my my area is a little bit more of you know what are the signs on the ground and what we see from the past. Okay, so I showed that graph showing that there were periods of warmer periods and cooler periods in the past as well, and the storminess and the increased flooding is something that we do see in the natural climate change um, uh, trends from the past. And it's occurring, it is connected. Um, and as I said, because of the increased uh, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, we're probably exasperating this uh, in the, the, the rapid heating. We're going above the, the levels that, we're, that we can recognize from the past. Um, it is linked. It can be expected that it will, be it will continue. Um, that's the bad news. Yeah, it is connected and it is expected to continue. Yep. Um, and what happens, I guess, you know, looking at the, the more bleak side of things, what happens if we do nothing to stop climate change? And, um, and on the flip side of that, how much time do we have to stop climate change? Right. Um, broad, well, broad, broadly speaking. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Under, under the, you know, under the models of what they call business as usual, um, there, the, the, it's been argued that we are in a time frame right now, you know, within the next decade, that if changes can be made, and this is why Biden and why the, the scientists are really pushing for this, you know, th these deadlines that we're talking about 2030, um, that we may, we're still at a point where we could reverse, we could change course with the technology that we have, with the knowledge that we have, not relying on any miracles, not relying on any, you know, magic uh, ma magicians popping out of a hat. Okay, so with the knowledge that we have, with the technology we have, we can turn this around, but it is true that it has to happen within the next decade. 
Yeah, well, that's certainly a, a positive note uh, to, for us to all take on, um, that there is still time to certainly um, change the course that we're on. But that's only with change, yeah, that's, <laughs> with that's those changes. Right. Without it, then then it, it will continue to, in the trends that we that we have right now, which continue heating, which means that there will be a lot of parts of the, the earth that are truly um, uninhabitable that we will not be we, we the planet will be fine yeah. okay the planet will be fine the planet's been here a long time we will not be very comfortable yeah yeah um and great you know another final question that i have uh, you know how is the university's research and you touched on a lot of your own research uh during the webinar but how is that research enabling us to better prepare for and and fight climate change um mm -hmm. even on that policy level Okay, well, um, if if you wouldn't mind, can I can I put up a couple slides about the department please, that kind of please. talk a little bit about that? Let me just share my screen again. We're okay for time. Good. Okay. Okay. I'll try not to be to repeat. Okay. Okay, is it showing correctly? That is, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so in the university, I've, of course, I'm in the Department of Marine Geosciences. So, so as I explained during the, the talk, you know, we're, we're working really on this, um, you know, I call it four dimensional because we have this deep time addition to the science that we're doing as we're looking at the planet. Um, and I think, you know, one of the areas specifically in the Charney School is that a lot of, the re, all the basically you know, the majority of the research that we're doing, we are interested in the marine aspect. Now, in terms of climate change and understanding how things are going, what we need to do or what is happening, the ocean is really key. You know, our planet is 70% water and we know so little about it yet we're already you know going forward and and building and developing and extracting from it and and yet we don't understand so one of the things that we're doing in our department as well as in the entire school is studying the marine area trying to uh, get baseline information so that we can watch these trends and so that we can have our canaries. Um, the Eastern Mediterranean, um, which is, uh, you know, where, where Israel is located, um, we have, it is one of the most um, representative of the changes that are going to happen in other parts of the world. What I mean by this is it has very slow circulation, so the salinity is increasing, the temperature is increasing, and it's increasing in a observable manner that we can measure on a year to year basis, much more than many other places of the world. So that earlier slide that I showed about the, you know, seeing is believing and that people have to have that, you know, in their face, our research is going to help to, to be able to ring the bell and say, look, this is what's gonna be like, you know, forever, you know, sadly we will feel it first, okay, where we are. And that also makes it very, uh, that much more important. Um, and so this is this is one of our, our focus, our, our focus. Um, you know, so for example, something as simple as mapping, you know, we, it, often the comparison is made that we have better maps of the moon surface than we do of the ocean floor. and. Our planet is 70% ocean. I mean, that that's absolutely absurd. So one of, or now we could even say Mars, you know, since we, we, we also know Mars a lot better than we know our own ocean. So one of the things that we do in the department is we are part of the solution of mapping this out so that we know what we have, you know, and so we know what we have so that we can protect it, so that we can watch for changes um, as they're, you know, and hopefully catch it before it's too late. Um, to help policymakers make decisions. You know, we talked about the tsunami research earlier that the research recognizing tsunamis in the offshore record, okay, in the sea. That research came from the sea, it did not come from land. And based on that, they were able to make the decision to make it a priority um, nationally and to have the, the tsunami, um, tsunami awareness and, and training and drills um, in order that should, when we have a tsunami that we'll know what to do. So the map that you're looking at right now, those little red lines are actually 
areas with a high resolution mapping every year we send our students out. We do a lot of other mapping on our own as researchers, but we also have a cruise where we take the students and they do the mapping. Okay, they do the mapping with us. They do the entire research project from start to finish. Um, and this is all part of our, our, graduate, pro our graduate program. Um, which we incorporate these ideals of exploration and experimentation. And the most important is the problem solving. So this circles back very nicely to, uh, to Lisa in the beginning, that what does that mean? <laughs> so um, at the university, we have um, begun to look at how we contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm proud to say that when we went through um, the, the 17 goals, and, and looked at the research that's happening in the department, and I would need a day to go over everybody's research. Um, but essentially, we cover all but a, you know, and all but about six of those of the sustainable goals. Okay, so we're we're you know gender equality. We've been working with um, uh, with public outreach to a lot of um, uh, communities, and particularly girls in the sea, and programs that we're working on that clean water. Um, poverty, natural hazard um, awareness and protection is one of the ways that you prevent uh, poverty in, in areas and disaster situations. Um, all of these, so, we, so we're covering and deliberately looking at how we can contribute to that. Um, so I, I hope that that answers the question. So, <laughs> and here's some, some, of, some of our people. Absolutely does. Um, wonderful. I mean, that looks like uh, it's all we'll have time for today. Dr. Gimanchenov, I want to thank you so much for giving us your time and knowledge on this very important topic. I'm going to turn us over to American Society of the University of Haifa interim CEO, Lisa Silverman, for some closing remarks. Thank you so much, James. Dr. Goodman Chernoff, thank you so much for your time with us and for sharing such valuable insights and information um, on your analysis and the future of coastal cities and climate change and especially all of the optimism there. I think uh, we all jump on board with you uh, with all of that hope. James, uh, sorry about the name confusion before. Thank you so much for fielding questions. And Jen, some, thank you very much for uh, facilitating managing the whole briefing. If any of you on the um, briefing have any questions or would like more information, please contact us at info at asuh.org. Uh, much of Dr. Goodman Chernoff's work and that of many of our faculty is enhanced or made possible um, by our philanthropic partnership. Some of those partners were mentioned earlier, an extra special thank you to you. Uh, to support Dr. Goodman Chernoff's work, the Charney School of um, Marine Sciences, or any of the University of Haifa programs, please visit us at www.asuh.org front slash donate. And again, thank you so very much for joining us today. Be healthy and safe, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Mm -hmm.